Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is to be able to share this word with you this morning um, out of our appointed gospel lesson, which we'll get to in just a moment. And it's going to be out of uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses uh, 25 through 34. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. And... Uh, as thinking on the sermon title, and I'm between Jesus' actual words, which are from the gospel lesson today, which is do not worry about your life, slash an Anglican bishop gets real about mental health. So uh, <laughs> I haven't decided which is the actual title, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out at some point during the uploading process. But um, so the titles of the message are Do Not Worry About Your Life, The Words of Jesus, or, or and or An Anglican Bishop Gets Real About Mental Health. So we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, just by way of introduction, one of my favorite church signs. Uh, I love church signs. I, I mean, most of the time I can't tell if they're trying to be funny or, or if they just don't know any better. But anyway, one of my favorites uh, is uh, don't let worry kill you, let the church help. <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, what's actually not a laughing matter, but is uh, sobering, are that 43% of all adults uh, suffer health effects due to worry and stress. And I am not ashamed to admit I'm one of the 43%. 75 to 90 percent of all visits to primary care physicians um, are stress-related complaints or disorders. There are an estimated, and this number has probably changed um, due to the coronavirus outbreak, but an estimated one million workers are absent on an average workday because of stress-related complaints. And I'm not talking about like the quote-unquote mental health day. I'm talking about real honest-to-goodness uh, stress-related complaints. Stress is said to be responsible for more than half of the 550 million workdays that are lost annually due to absenteeism. 43% of all employee turnover is related to job stress. That was a telling sign for me. I was on vacation um, in Chicago and I it was a Saturday or a Sunday. And the sheer thought of having to go back into the office on Monday, I got up from the hotel couch from where I was sitting, went to the bathroom, got physically sick, and then came back. Uh, and I thought, I, I need to change. Uh, there's something wrong here. Thinking about going back to the office like that. Is, is not good for me. It's not good for my health. Then when you add to the list of mental fatigue and sleepless nights, and then we've got peaceless days, we get a glimpse of the havoc that worry plays in destroying the quality of life. And by the way, has anyone noticed that we're in a global pandemic? I'd like to be a man of faith and say we're in the middle of it, which means we're almost done. But no, I mean, it feels like it was a lifetime ago that uh, we were in the middle of the Tiger King lockdown. Now, when is this going to be over? Talking about yet another wave. Uh, when I checked the news this morning. I mean, as I broadcast this, Today is the 14th of June, 2020. There are 117,000 dead in the United States. A lamentable, and might I add preventable number, that number could have been much lower um, had it not been for failure of leadership in our country or um, having some presence of leadership or, or, or however you want to word that, but there are 117,000 dead Americans 
from COVID-19, and there are 2.12 million cases reported as of today, as of the recording, this morning on the 14th of June, 2020. So as I preach today on do not worry about your life and or slash an Anglican bishop gets real about mental health, I feel like such a hypocrite. Let me just be very honest before I pray. Uh, I feel like such a hypocrite preaching this message today out of the gospel because God has been dealing with me about this very topic. In fact, he's been dealing with me on this for 25 years. But um, nonetheless, I feel called to give you this message and I pray as uh, difficult or awkward as it is, I pray that this is going to be a great blessing to you wherever you are uh, today. So let's pray and then uh, we'll get into Matthew chapter six. Father, we bless your name today. Lord, we love you. We exalt you, we worship you, and we lift you up. God, we ask in the next few moments, would you speak to us clearly? Would you release your presence and the power and the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit? Would you confront us, challenge us, change us, and draw us closer to you? And to that end, I'm available to you, Lord, to use me according to your will would you stand in my body, think with my mind, and speak with my tongue, and then you, Lord, receive all the honor, glory, and praise, for you alone are worthy. And we ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. So let's have a look at today's appointed gospel lesson. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 25 through 34. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. And we're going to have a look uh, at what Jesus says about worry. And this is actually part of Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. So uh, Matthew 6, 25, the Bible says this, Jesus speaking, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Let me stop right here for just a moment. The Greek translation of do not worry literally means to be drawn in different directions. Isn't that a powerful picture? That is what do not worry literally means, is to be drawn in different directions. That worry can pull us apart. Until we as humans interfere, everything in the created order works together because all of nature, and that's what Jesus is illustrating here first, all of nature trusts God but you and I are worried or we are pulled apart because of the future, because of the unknown. Jesus was saying that God the Father has built into his creation the means by which all things are cared for. So Jesus says, do not worry about your life. But why? Look in verse 26. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Let me stop right here for just a moment. Well, you might be thinking, like I was thinking when I was reading this, whatever, Jesus, what are you, what are you talking about? I mean, I mean, the birds don't have mortgages, you know. The bird babies don't have orthodont or you know orthodontist bills. <laughs> uh, you know, they don't have to put bird babies through college. Birds don't have car payments. But what Jesus is trying to get across to us is that God cares for the birds, and you and I are much more valuable 
than any bird or animal, so God will definitely provide for his children. We don't have to worry because God will take care of our needs. That is a promise. Consider the birds. The birds are fed because they, they diligently work to maintain their lives. They don't store up great amount. They don't store up great amounts of food, but they do continually work. I will say this. There's a long list, and this is for another day, of, of Bible verses that actually don't appear in the Bible, but God helps those that help themselves. Actually, not in the Bible, <laughs> friends. But the principle certainly is, this might be it. I'm not exactly sure yet, but, uh, but, but I believe this might be the principle uh, where, this, where that comes from. I'm not exactly sure, but that's for another time. Um, Matthew 6, verses 28 through 30, reading on Matthew 6, 28 through 30, the Bible says this, uh, and why are you anxious about clothing, Jesus said? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Verse 29, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Let me stop right here for just a moment. So consider the lilies, Jesus says. The lilies grow daily and it's through a natural process. Uh, Lilies grow from a deep root. The roots are where they belong. They belong in the soil in order to receive their nourishment. And it is the same with believers. The roots of believers are not to be in the things of this earth, though, in order to receive their nourishment and fulfill their purpose on earth. We, as believers, put our roots where they belong in God and in his righteousness. God said he would feed us. God said he would clothe us. It is our little faith. That is such a hard word. And I'll talk about that in a second. It is our little faith that hinders him from working as he would. He does have great blessings for us if we only yield to him and live for the things that truly count. Jesus is illustrating through nature that we are not to be anxious about our existence, which is a great word for us in the middle of COVID-19. As I was praying over the scriptures, discerning what the Lord wanted me to teach on, this verse hit me like a ton of bricks, and I want to go back to it. It's in verse 27. Matthew 6, verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, could add a single hour to his span of life? Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? We need to do, we do need to ask ourselves, um, which of you by worrying can, it's not gonna add time to your, to your day. And we act, and I know I do, I act as if that will solve the problem. That by worrying, it, it, will, it will get it done. It will solve the problem somehow. It is easy to believe this in principle, but it is in practice where I get hung up. So there will always be new challenges every day. Concerns, there will be problems, there will be choices. Will we worry or will we pray? Will worrying be of any help whatsoever? And I can speak to you as a worrier first class. (laughs) I have medals and everything in it. Is that... uh, it can damage it can damage our health it can take time away 
instead of adding to it, is what Jesus is saying. If you worry, if I worry, it will not change the outcome. That is human thinking. I think that's just, um, that's, sadly, I, that is not how we're wired. We're wired to not worry and to trust in the Lord, but it is human thinking to say we will change the outcome. I will change the outcome by thinking this through, by worrying this out, by thinking of every possible scenario. At least that's how it works in my head. I don't know about yours. You may have a child that has decided to live a destructive lifestyle. Your worrying will not change the outcome. We may have a sick family member and worrying will not change the outcome. You may have heard of rumors of downsizing or the bad news of the coronavirus economy is getting closer and closer. The reality of it is getting closer and closer every day. If it has not hit you or me already, worrying will not change the outcome. Worrying cannot change any situation in our lives. It will not change the outcome, but it will change us. Worry has a transformative power, but so does the Lord. Amen. I would be, I would prefer to be changed into his likeness and not into the likeness of worry, where that is all I reflect. I would prefer to be reflecting God's glory instead of reflecting worry everywhere I go. Uh, verses six, uh, rather Matthew chapter six, verses 31 through 33. Matthew six thirty-one through 33, the Bible says this, uh, Jesus speaking, do, therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Verse 32, for the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Let me stop right here for just a moment. The word seek in verse 33 uh, the Greek word is zeteo, and it means to go after, to strive, to pursue, to desire, to aim at, to search for, to endeavor, to get. The believer's life is not to be preoccupied with material things, even if they are necessary. But the believer is, first of all, to be seeking after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're to look to God first. God promises that our needs will be provided for, but we have so many worries because you and I are seeking everything but God first. So how do we do that? How do we seek him first? Remember the Greek word, so it's, it's active. The word seek in verse 33 the Greek word means to go after, to strive, to pursue, to desire, to aim at, to search for, to endeavor to get. So how do we seek God first? It means making time for prayer and reading the word of God. We will put God first in every week by making worship a priority. We put God first every payday by giving of our financial gifts unto the Lord. Let me zoom out for a moment and let me talk about what does this mean to us practically? And then, um, and then I'm going to close. In Philippians, also appointed our New Testament lesson that was appointed for today. In Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven. Um, here, let me just read this. Philippians chapter four, verse, uh, verses six and seven, uh, St. Paul writing, 
do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, let me stop right here for just a moment. So the, uh, maybe this is a sermon now as I'm saying, as, as I'm preaching this in real time, it, it was, uh, the, the title of it was Do Not Worry About Your Life. Uh, and maybe part two is an Anglican bishop gets real <laughs> about mental health. Uh, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's what God had on my mind today. So St. Paul saying uh, in Philippians 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yes and amen. But when I was in college, uh, I started to realize that I was struggling with major depression and suffered some severe anxiety attacks. Um, the anxiety was so real, crippling, even moments those were those those are moments and I can remember them like they were like it was just yesterday and um, it was 25 years ago so let me share a few things the anxiety was real but I had to also decide a few things there were a number of things that were kind of being unfolded in front of me as this was all happening. The anxiety was real, but I had to decide that it was no match for Jesus. On the one hand, yes, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit as an offensive weapon against worry and anxiety. We just celebrated uh, Pentecost Sunday, the arrival of the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in a surprising, violent, one might say, way in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, sending forth the 120 disciples who were gathering, waiting on the promise of the Father. He shows up, empowers them for service, fills them to overflowing with his anointing. They are sent forth into the world, and the world is not and the world is never the same as the church goes forth in power and under the authority to preach the name of Jesus and unveil his glory to the world. So we just celebrated that. Pentecost Sunday and the gift of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Thanksgiving, which is what Paul is laying out here in Philippians 6 and 7, these are offensive weapons against anxiety. God desperately wants to grant us his peace. That's a promise as he guards our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Yes and amen. I receive that. That is the defensive guard over our hearts and minds, the peace of Jesus Christ. There is nothing quite like peace of mind. You stay healthier, you stay uh, physically and mentally healthier because gar God guards our hearts and minds. So yes and amen to all of that, but God has also given us physicians, medicine, science, therapists, friends, 
the support of a local church, all of these other things as well to give us, to help give us peace, to help guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, to help us with anxiety. When I was in college, I had a lot on my plate. Um, I was paying my way through school. I had quite a few jobs uh, to make ends meet. Uh, I worked from midnight to eight at a radio station in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and uh, would, would drive as quickly as I could to my campus at Cornell College, about 30 minutes away, get a quick shower and be at my nine o'clock class. And I thought maybe it's because of my schedule or maybe it was a bad breakup or maybe it was this, 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 and this. But then I started to realize this is not garden variety, just college student anxiety. But yeah, I had a lot on my plate and I just tried to kind of press on through the pain. That's the kind of guy I am. But it's one of the reasons why I love my alma mater so much, Cornell College in Iowa, because they, they saved my life. I went to the student health center in order to get the help I actually didn't know I needed. The nurse on duty and the community physician looked at me and said, this, this isn't good and we want to help you. I think there are three dangerous things that the church can do when talking about mental health or mental wellness. The first thing is uh, make it easy believism. When, you're, when, the church, when the church speaks sometimes about mental health, if it does at all, it's easy believism. For example, you could read Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven, be anxious for nothing. Well, God said it, I believe it, and that's it. It's not that simple, friends. Um, a little... I actually don't remember when this, oh, here it is. It was actually dated. So February the 6th, 2018, uh, I got into a Twitter fight with um, John Piper or whoever manages John Piper's Twitter account. I doubt I was actually in a Twitter fight with John Piper. But <laughs> whoever, whoever it was from Desiring God's Twitter feed, so on February 6, 2018, this person, John Piper or, so, or someone, tweeted out, we will find mental health when we stop staring in the mirror and fix our eyes on the strength and beauty of God. We will find mental health when we stop staring in the mirror and fix our eyes on the strength and beauty of God. And like I said, when the church does choose to speak about mental health, mental wellness, um, it's easy believism, and this is one of them. I tweeted back very quickly. I said, I love Dr. John Piper's ministry, but this is dangerously close to prosperity gospel preaching. Those who struggle with depression and anxiety or other mental health issues do not automatically lack faith. I wrote that two years ago, and I still believe it today. I'm here to tell you it's okay to struggle. It is okay to struggle. Just read the Psalms. You'll know exactly what I mean. In Psalm 6, verse 6, the psalmist writes, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch 
with my weeping. Probably not a little tchotchke you're going to find at the Christian bookstore, if they even have Christian bookstores at the other end of, this is very dark humor, but at the other end of coronavirus. But does that sound like something a human being would say? Yes, absolutely. Even a Christian? Yes, absolutely. Even this Christian? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I'm wearing this stole today. It is one of my favorite uh, stoles. And this is from the Diocese of Sabah in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. It was given to me. And in Chinese, I don't know if you can quite make out the whole thing. I'm going to step back from the camera as best as I can. It's quite, um, it's quite lovely. But you'll just have to believe me when I tell you that this is Psalm 126, verse 5, for those of you who do not read Chinese. Psalm 126, verse 5. Sow in tears and reap with shouts of joy. Those who sow in tears will reap harvests of shouts of joy. What a promise from God. He sees, it's an acknowledgement from God that there is sadness, there is struggle, there's depression, there's all of these things. But we are sowing these things and these are not things that God just doesn't see. But he will allow us one day to reap to harvest those, those, those shouts of joy. So I love so much, and I, and I love this reminder when I get to put this on in this season, in this liturgical season. Sow in tears, those who sow in tears will reap with harvest of shouts of joy. The way I put it is God does not want to waste perfectly good suffering. God does not want to waste perfectly good suffering. He's so good like that. Another dangerous thing the church can do when talking about mental wellness, so I said, first, make it easy believism. And then second, to say nothing. To say nothing. Silence from the pulpit means to some that, that struggle, and actually there's more than we think. But silence from the pulpit is a signal that the church doesn't care. And if that you do struggle, would you do it quietly? Would you do it with as much shame as possible? Because we're not gonna talk about it. So we're basically telling you, you shouldn't either. So, again, three dangerous things the church can do when talking about mental wellness, make it easy believism, saying nothing, and then third, make our faith in faith the way we get to healing instead of faith in God. Make our faith in faith the way we get to healing instead of faith in God. What do I mean by that? Well, simply put, I believe in divine healing. That is, God is the ultimate healer on this side of heaven. Whether he does it supernaturally or through medicine, however he does it, God is our healer. What I don't believe in is in faith healing. In that, all of our healing rests solely on our faith in faith that God isn't even in the picture. I just, just believe it. Just, just, you just got to, you just got to believe it. 
So if I struggle with my mental wellness, it is because my faith isn't strong enough. That is what I mean by saying making our faith in faith the way that we get to healing instead of faith in God. As I shared earlier, as I was getting real about what was unfolding, and a lot of this does um, make itself known as, as in uh, young adulthood. And so as I was confiding this um, struggle in a pastor, and I thought stupidly, <laughs> my pastor will get this and maybe he'll pray for me. Um, I blacked out for some of the conversation, mostly just because I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But I was, so I, I shared what I was struggling with in my mental wellness. And this pastor, a, 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 a godly man, I'm not gonna take that away from him, but we will do, we'll just be disagreed on this. He told me about a time where he threw his contact lenses and his glasses into the toilet or the garbage and he rebuked his bad eyesight in the name of Jesus, cursed the devil, cursed the bad eyesight, took authority over his eyesight, and then he was healed. And that worked for him. And I needed to do the same thing with the medicine that I was given. Just throw it away. Declare, decree and declare that Jesus is greater and, and you know, <laughs> you, you know the scriptures, I, I, I do too. But if I did that, I would be healed. If I did the same thing, well, I didn't do that 25 years ago. In fact, I still, I still take my medicine And um, here I'll show you this. This is the, the world's saddest advent calendar. <laughs> but as, as I said, the, the title of this, I think the titles of this sermon are Do Not Worry About Your Life, and then an Anglican bishop gets real about mental health. This is what life looks like and I'm not ashamed about it, but um, I didn't do that 25 years ago. I didn't throw this in, in the toilet, in the garbage 25 years ago. Um, I still take my medicine and I'm still a Christian. I'm still filled with the Holy Spirit. My friends, you are in Christ. I am in Christ. I am not generalized anxiety disorder. You, if you struggle with bipolar disorder, you are not bipolar. You are not major depressive disorder. We are in Christ. Full stop. These are clinical diagnostic terms that are helpful to a degree. But ultimately, as the people of God, a mental health diagnosis is not the defining characteristic of who we truly are in Christ. And sadly, I don't think that gets preached not nearly enough then I refuse to be silent about this as well. Let me wrap up this message and say this. Yes, we do see from the word of God that worry is no match for Jesus. He has given us, thank God, his word for strength and encouragement. He's given us 
the Holy Spirit who indwells richly within us for empowering and anointing. He has given us the local church for a community to rally around each other so that we are not alone. And for those who struggle as a fellow struggler, as a fellow pilgrim on the way, if this is, if this is you like it is for me, God has also given us the wisdom of physicians and medicine and science to help us deal with a vast array of issues. And seeking out help, however we need to do it, does not negate my faith or your faith. Seeking out help does not negate my faith or your faith. Yes, as Christians, our lives are to point to one greater than ourselves, greater than our problems. We have the same problems as non-Christians to show the world something in that following Christ gives us a different response to the challenges of this life and resting in God and relying on God, he can provide for us no matter the circumstances, no matter pandemic, what the pandemic brings, no matter what the economy brings, no matter what our mental wellness brings. Jesus did not say, Pretend the hard stuff doesn't exist. He didn't say that. He did call us, though, to make a decision. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Sometimes it's struggle first. It is for me some days, getting up in the morning, struggle first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then struggling at some point leads to stumbling and then turns into seeking, active seeking. But that is the goal. And I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Let's pray. Grant, O oh Lord, that the course of this world may be peaceably governed by your providence and that your church may joyfully serve you in confidence and serenity through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.